The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Now that we're in the third season of The Ben Heck Show, we'd love to get some feedback from you, our viewers, on how you feel about the changes we've made. Please go to www.revision3.com forward slash TBHS survey and spend a few moments taking this anonymous survey. Your feedback is very important to us. Thank you. And now, back to your regularly scheduled episode. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we'll finally finish building the slot loading Nintendo we've been working on. I tried a bunch of different ideas to create a functional cartridge connector, and I finally found a reliable solution. We'll take a look at that and then build a custom case to put it all in. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today in Ben News, I'd like to show you this traffic light computer I'm working on for AMD. It's got the AMD APU here on this MSI motherboard. I made these angled 3D printed supports to hold the motherboard in place. And they're solid state relays which control the three traffic lights. And my idea is this thing's going to pulsate with the music playing off of your computer. So some op amps or microcontroller will control the solid state relays which will cause these to flash. And they're quite bright too. So yes, it'll be a nice uh, party room decoration. Mm, mm, mm. Beatbox. Mm, mm, mm. In our last episode, we were trying to make the grabbers to hold onto the cartridge, and it was a pain in the butt. I finally did come up with a solution since then, which I'm going to show you now. So here's the slot loading mechanism that you've already seen. Here's the new grabber system for the cartridge. Now what the problem was before was we had those short little connections, and they couldn't flex very much. So in order to make up for the deviation in all the different pieces, if the tines are longer, they can all have more flexibility allowing them to compensate for the other ones not being exactly right. So I made this jig, which has a top and bottom, for the bottom of the cartridge and the top, and it's geared along with the servo. And it has an open position like this, and what happens is it bites down on the cartridge, and the tines are all flexible, and because they're longer, they have more flex. So let me give you a demonstration. Turn it on. Some of it's hooked up manually right now, but plug this in. Cartridge goes in. And lining up this to this was a real pain. Then I'm just gonna manually, right now, do you see it bite down? Watch it. Open, closed. Okay, so it lines up and the pins go to the right depth. Now we'll manually make the pins close. See them bite down. Turn on the Nintendo. And there's our game. Turning on the Nintendo will actually be controlled by the microcontroller. When it's loading, it'll basically hold in the reset line in the Nintendo. And then once it's loaded and clamped, it releases it or opens it. And then the Nintendo is allowed to turn on. Likewise, when you eject the cartridge, it'll pause the Nintendo, open the teeth, and then eject the cartridge. Now that I know it works, I can wire this servo into the main circuit so that all happens in sequence. I'm going to replace the power regulator on this because it's getting a little hot with the servo. But then I can wire up the rest of the Nintendo stuff and make a case and make it look cool. I've removed the RF modulator, as you can see, but there are a few things on it we have to replicate. It had the power regulator on it, old 7805, 
Also, it had an amplifier for the video, so I've replaced the video amplifier by adding the circuit here. You can find this circuit easily online by looking up Nintendo amplifier circuit for video. To replace the regulator, I'm going to use this more efficient switching regulator. It does the same thing as the 7805 switching package. I can solder it right in place here, and I'll take care of the power regulation for the Nintendo, and then it'll work great. The main power switch on the Nintendo is hooked up to these pins here. Normally this allowed current to the 7805, so what I'm going to do is we'll have our input power come in here. This switch will turn on the whole system, and then it'll come through here and power the 5 volt regulator. And then we use another one of the regulators for the circuit in here. That way we're spreading the load out across a couple different regulators. One thing that sucks is I have to move this whole thing as one unit now. So it's kind of like a human centipede, but made of a Nintendo. <laughs> Finding the tiny surface mount part you just dropped? Ooh, not easy. Quickly finding the latest technology, thousands of in-stock parts, services, and solutions on the Element 14 store? Now that's easier. Discover all of the ways we're building an easier experience at element14.com forward slash evolution. Now I have everything running off of one wall wart. It goes into the Nintendo here. There's a switching regulator to power the Nintendo filter capacitor. Then there's two regulators down here. There's one for these two servos, and then there's a separate one for the clamping servo, because I didn't want to put all the power onto one regulator. All right, let's see if this works. All right, so here's how the system works. I have one of the microcontroller lines hooked up to the reset line on the Nintendo. The Nintendo, when you push reset, what it does is it connects five volts from the LED to the reset line. So that means the Nintendo system reset active high. If you put one on the line, it causes it to reset. So what my microcontroller does is it actually takes over the reset line. So when I push reset, it's going to reset the Nintendo, open the tines, and then kick out the cartridge. All right. All right, so here we go. The Nintendo's on, sticking the cartridge. Clamps, Nintendo's unreset. Ta-da! There's a complete cycle. Now that the Nintendo is finally working, I can start working on the case design. So I'm gonna draw it up on the computer here, route it on the CNC machine, and then assemble it. Here are the mounting holes I believe I should need for this. I'm gonna put the components on this and then I'll build the rest of the case around it. Oh, I put those pieces in backwards. <laughs> There's your problem.
Ah, gravity! Consider if you will, Ben Heckendorf, a man who hates gravity. But soon he'll learn that gravity is important in the Twilight Zone. Oh, it's the right symbol this time. After all that work, this thing is finally done. We've got it working and inside its own custom case. So now I just want to go home, hook up to my TV, and play some video games. Go Mario! It's so awesome to play a Nintendo game on a slot loading Nintendo. Let's see if I can remember where the secret crap is. Yeah, got you Goomba. Whoa! Ah! Got him. I faced many trials and tribulations and faced perilous danger, but I managed to put an automatically loading cartridge system into an original Nintendo console. Now I'm going to play Mario. My rave today is that I've actually gotten some rewards from Kickstarter projects, specifically Ouya, Digisparks, Pinball Arcade, and that mini SD card holder for the Raspberry Pi. As I've said before, it's great to see people succeed with their new inventions, and I intend to continue kickstarting things into the future. However, my rant today is about every third project on Kickstarter being a wallet. Why does the world need so many new kinds of wallets? And they're all the same too, just two pieces of metal rubber banded together. What is wrong with a good old fashioned wallet like this one? Look, it holds all sorts of stuff and it did not require a degree in rocket engineering to build it. It's great that people are funding their dreams. It just seems like a lot of people have the same dream and it always fits in your pocket. Today's viewer question comes from the Mukunji Madman who asks, when working with woods and plastics using a table saw and drill press, what materials do you suggest for durability? Well, for wood, anything but particle board, and get plywood with as many plies, aka layers, as possible. As for plastic, polycarbonate is better than acrylic as it won't shatter or chip. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be doing a tutorial for Autodesk's free 3D modeling program, Autodesk 1-2-3D Design. It's a great resource for creating 3D printable objects. We'll see you then. 
Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.